Hello and welcome along to On The Whistle. I'm your host, Zain Nabi. Um, if I sound a bit tired today, it's because I've been up with um, my sons last night. They were pretty ill, but we'll, we'll find that that is a trend throughout the show. Um, those who have young kids, those who have pets, you'll know that that is just a reality of life. But let that not hide my enthusiasm about the African Football League. Um, we had the inaugural final um, on uh, on Sunday, and that was won by the Brazilians. No, not the uh, South Americans, uh, not those who donned the famous jersey and have won many trophies. It was by Mamelodi Sundowns, um, the team that are the kings of the continent right now. Um, and for those of you tuning into On the Whistle, I'm your host, Zain Nabi. Uh, we like to market ourselves as Africa's biggest bri, where we are able to discuss, debate, and bring you the latest on all the African football news on the continent and around the world. And joining me now to chop it up after Sundowns won the two-legged final against Wiener Casablanca 3-2 on aggregate is the one and only Alistair Howarth, our very own OTW cross-platform reporter and, of course, co-host and the North African football expert and host of the newly minted African Fiverside podcast, Mahim Azari, also struggling with sleep. How are you lads doing? Doing very well. It's nice to be with you guys and to be talking about already a, a continental trophy already just in uh, in the month of November. It's quite weird, but it's nice. Yeah, I, I was going to say that whole saying Mamori Sundowns are, you know, the kings of the continent, champions of the continent. I, I don't. I guess we'll get into it, but I don't know. Is that accurate? When you've got a different Champions League winner, a different AFL winner, who knows? But but either way, it looked like it was. <laughs> it, it looked like it was some good brying weather down down in Pretoria. You know, it looked like a nice hot day for and hoping the Brazilians were able to enjoy, even if even if Chiefs fans were, um, weren't weren't able to enjoy the weekend as much after their their own loss against the Pirates. But happy to be here, Zay. Hey, hey, listen, if you can beat Al Ali and um, we'd add in a tournament and throw in Petro Luanda, I think that's I think that's a pretty good mix of teams. I think you can call yourselves the kings of the continent until, of course, we see the two legged final in the African Champions League. Um, but listen, there's lots to discuss, lots to dissect. Um, I know we'll have reflections on the tournament, but I think it's probably best to start by looking at the actual final, the African Football League. Um, you know, it's played over two legs. Um, the um, the um, uh, We'd had winning the, the first leg 2-1 at home in Casablanca, went to play the second leg in Pretoria, where Sundowns did the business. Um, they won 2-0 to secure the title on aggregate. Goals from Peter Shalulile at the Namibian Springbok and Aubrey Modiba in either side of halftime doing the business. I certainly enjoyed the game. I think it's the most people I've seen arrive at a Sundowns game in a long time. And I'd like to know the strategy there besides free entry. But um, let me open that up to both of you guys right now. On a balance of the football played across both legs, would you agree that Sundowns were worthy winners of the first inception of this tournament? Yeah, I, I would say absolutely. I think in the first leg, it was very evenly matched in Morocco. Um, and if you're playing an evenly matched game in Morocco in that hostile atmosphere, in that crowd, that means that you're you're going above and beyond. And then the return leg, it didn't seem like we did were very interested in playing football. They were, they were playing this low block. They were kind of inviting pressure on. And even in the second half, after Sundowns opened the scoring, I thought they still held on to possession. They were still playing brave and courageously. And so I think overall on the balance of play, they deserved uh, their victory without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and I think it was important for them to get this over we did because if we exclude Esperance to Tunis, I think we did sundowns and El Ahli are the top three clubs in Africa, but it seems like sundowns get the better of El Ahli because El Ahli try to play football. Uh, El Ahli get the better of we did, but we did get the better of sundowns. It's like this weird little triangle, um, but that's partly because we did play negatively and they can sort of hit you on set pieces and, and you can get unlucky against them with own goals. And in that first uh, fixture in Casablanca, it kind of seemed like, you know, there was a goalkeeping error. There, you know, there was an own goal and kind of felt like they were avoidable errors as usual and that we that were going to squeak through. But uh, to see Sundowns insist with their style of play and, and create good chances and, and take the game to, to the, I was going to say the Moroccan champions, but they're not the Moroccan champions, to, to, the, to the biggest club in Morocco uh, the way that they did. Uh, very, very impressed with Sundowns. 
Well, well, Ali, is, is it as simple as that? You have Mamelodi Sundowns who play the silky smooth possession-based football, and then you have the street fighters, the um, um, astute um, uh, widad uh, who are able to break down play street fighting, um, you know, uh, intent on slowing the game down and breaking it up. Is that how we break down the finals and how we break down how this played out? I think for me, one of the most humorous moments of this final was an exchange in the first half when you had Shakri um, al Bagheri was carded uh, for time-wasting. Um, he was injured or feigning an injury, depending how you want to describe it. And the referee ordered him to get off the field in, in a stretcher after he climbed up to walk um, and uh, then ended up getting carded. Um, it was one of the moments that probably talks to what uh, Maher spoke about with Widad's tactics. But is it as simple and broad tax as that you have the football and the anti-football? I, like, I, I think yes, yes and no. I think like it's weird analyzing sundowns because... I think in terms of performances over the last three years in these games, you know, like, like Maher said perfectly, you know, you essentially got three big teams. Esperance haven't quite been the same team the last three or four years, still very competitive, but you know, you'd say al Ahly, you know, uh, Widad and Sundowns have been the clear three, but Sundowns have been by far and away clear, but uh, ahead of Esperance and al Ahly in terms of the football they play. And, you know, we talk about, you know, that Widad getting the better of them, you know, that win in the first leg, I think it's Widad's only win against Sundowns in seven games. And Sundowns are undefeated in seven games against al Ahly. So I feel like it's very easy as us kind of to read too much into individual kind of results instead of performances, because I think actually I felt like the most impressive performance Sundowns have given us was actually last was last season's Champions League earlier this year away in Widad when they were down to 10 men, eventually down to nine men the last couple of minutes. And they managed the game so well. They still were the better team. They played the good football. But I remember us sitting around this very same Bry, uh, this virtual Bry, and us saying, I think it was Maher pointed out, he's like, you know, look, Sundown's got this fantastic nil-nil draw away in Morocco. This is a brilliant result, especially considering they were down to nine and then t- uh, 10 and then nine players. But the one thing they were missing was a goal. And we saw the value of away goals and the difference that it makes, both in the, in the Champions League, when when Widad got the better of, of, of Sundowns with the 2-2 draw in Pretoria, but, and then this time when Sundowns got that all-important win because you just felt as soon as they got that first goal, as soon as Shalilule Shal- uh, got that goal, and again, we saw how much they've been missing him in this tournament, you just felt like there, there wasn't really a way back for Widad because kind of like Maher said, they, they, they can't compete with sundowns particularly away from home they can't attack in the same way that they want to and they potentially could at home i think but i do think what we also saw was a and i think adil ramsey pointed this out was that i mean um, i mean the, the the end of the game was a farce right well I yeah mean, exactly is that, time wasting exactly by sundowns. It's sun, sun, sundowns and that's what he said i think he was saying that the sundowns had, i think he used the word experience like and that's that that is that sundowns maturing performance and again it's so like it is impossible with Rulani McQuinn, and it's almost to the point of like absolute kind of absurdity, the parallels with Pep Guardiola, because both play this, you know, incredibly intricate, you know, controlling football, very innovative, blah, blah, blah. And then eventually they actually get the best results when they don't perhaps have as good a season, but they play a little more pragmatically, you know, Pep brings yeah. his four center backs with sundowns. It comes from a more kind of mm-hmm. quote unquote mature performance where they're willing to play dirty. They're playing down to, to, to Widad's level instead of perhaps playing up to theirs. Um, but yeah, for me, ultimately the difference, mm-hmm. I think sundowns were the worthy winners. I don't think they were by far and away better than Widad, but I, what I would say is the big difference maker was when sundowns went to Morocco, they competed. But when Widad came down to, to yeah. South Africa, they didn't compete. And that, and that was the biggest difference for me is that is that Sundowns were able to compete away from home. And again, that's that's all the difference is, is those away goals. A lot has been said of Rolani McQuena. I mean, the Pep Guardiola um, parallels are there. My hair, I know you interviewed him. So, you know, let me bring you in right now. Um, he's shown by far and away, he's one of Africa's most intelligent and tactically astute and interesting managers to follow. But the fact that he now has a continental title, has that propelled him to new heights? I think so. I think so. Um, Because what we all know about Rolani Mokwena is that tactically, he's probably the best coach on the continent. He's, as you mentioned, he's only 36 years old. He's young. He's brilliant. 
And when you watch his team play football, they play with, you know, all these, you know, these inverted fullbacks, you know, they'll play the box midfields, they'll play uh, this positionless style of football where you can have somebody like Aubrey Modiba, who's, I guess, traditionally left back playing in central midfield and, and just being a sort of Swiss army knife. The, the pressing, the counter pressing, it's all like things out of, you know, Guardiola's or, or Arteta's playbook. But with when you have these like maniac, maniacal tacticians, I always wonder about can they man manage, number one, and how do they deal yeah. with the intangibles in football? And I think in this match, he took a very big step forward because you mentioned that uh, Al Bahri, the, the Moroccan uh, striker uh, who was sort of wasting time in the first half. And I, I saw Mokwena do this with like with his, I saw him do this as Al Bahri was meaning like, put your blinders on, don't be distracted, don't be frustrated. He was telling his players like, do not be at all like frustrated by the by Widad's antics. And then the minute before Shalulile's goal, he pulls aside Teboho Mokwena and he's talking to him. I don't know what he's telling him, obviously. I wish somebody had asked, but he's obviously having a very like uh, intense conversation with Mokwena. And Mokwena is integral to that goal. He's in the link-up play. He gets the shot off and Shalulile goes and slots home the rebound. And so I see like, in addition to the tactics, in addition to the style of play, those are like psychological man management moments, very clear ones in that match that really propelled his team to victory. And you guys mentioned that at the very end of the match, I believe it took them five minutes to take a free kick. Like, and a Sundowns player, oh, well, I think he started with Mudao, I mean, and then Ronwin Williams uh, was booked, uh, McQuena was booked. It was I mean, incredible. that was ridiculous, right? And But but, but I, I don't know if this karma of sorts where <laughs> Sundowns are doing to Weedad what Weedad would do to other teams. Yeah, and it's absolutely. like, yeah. Take See, that, medicine, yeah. Exactly. It, that's exactly. <laughs> I think they felt aggrieved by, you know, El Ahli and We Dead and Esperance, especially the way they'll, they'll, they'll employ the dark arts. And I think like these tournaments that the Champions League, the AFCON, the intangibles factor in so heavily in these tournaments, you have to be able to influence the slightest of inches to win these trophies. And I think that Sundowns have finally understood that. McQuinn has finally understood that. And so the fact that he's not just playing this, you know, uh, ethereal, uh, theoretical style of football, but he's incorporated pragmatic elements with man management uh, moments. I think has lifted him to another level. And if he can continue to stack these trophies on and on and on, I think we're finally going to see Mokwena make that late trip to to Europe that we're all expecting him to in a matter of years. Zayn, let me just tell you, I'll I'll tell you one thing. I'm sure I'm sure Rulani Mokwena has spent the last couple months watching the Rugby World Cup. Because let me tell you, <laughs> let, me, let me tell you what that that coaching performance reminded me of of one man and one man, Razi Erasmus. That you know, in the same way that Razi in that semi final against mm-hmm. England, every time England had a set piece, he would bring on a sub, but just one sub, never more than one. And then England would get a line out. He'd bring on one sub to disrupt. Uh, to disrupt the play it was the exact same kind of energy like like Myers that they were like a rotating cast of bookings kind of like okay who can who can stall out the game here who can stall out the game here and get booked who can you know cut down with that player here and, and take a booking for the team and I think yeah that, like that is that is the kind of kind of game intelligence but it's also a huge credit to his players you know we talk about you know again like the, the you know mm-hmm. thinking about Pep you, you think who are his kind of generals on the field and you think the likes of Rodri, the likes of Fernandino, and you're seeing the same thing in the Sundowns team with the, with guys like Mudao, like Modiba, you know, they're, yeah. they're taking charge on that pitch saying, okay, you know, we're going to, we're going to play to play down to this with team, but we're going to play it in a clever way and, and, and kill the game. But I think Mokwena has clearly been watching, watching the box and, and taking notes because there's a masterclass in terms of managing the team. Well, you know, we, we talk about the style of football, right? And it's no doubt, it's it's really beautiful to watch. And, you know, I'll keep reiterating, it's kept on the carpets. It's built from the back. It's 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 great passing, technically very accurate. And I remember we had Ryan Hunt, who's the Sundowns assistant sporting director on this podcast, where he was explaining that the most important metric for him, for Rolani and for the team is uh, ball speed. Because he said the teams that can move the ball the quickest – um, are the teams that tend to be the most successful, the teams that tend to create more opportunities, the teams that tend to get more goals. And when you watch that final, you look at the execution on that, and that ball is moving very quickly along the carpet. You look at the backroom staff with somebody like Mankoba Magniti. I used to report on him regularly at Golden Arrows, uh, Abafana Bestende, my team from Durban. Um, and 
when he was working with the team with a very small budget, you might be wondering what that means, Mahir, but it means the backheel boys uh, because they play with a flair and a, and a style that not many, um, not many other teams could be known for. And you look at that game plan, and I know Mankoba relatively well. I used to report on his teams. If you have somebody like that, and Rolani has that as one of his generals in the back room, you can see how synced up everyone is, whether it's the assistant sporting director and Ryan Hunt, whether it's uh, Mankoba himself in implementing uh, what they want to do. And what I would say, what Mankoba could never really do with this Golden Arrows team was have the quality up front to finish. And this is what the Sundowns team has in goal poacher uh, Peter uh, Shalulile, who's absolutely magnificent. Um, and I would love to see him get a run um, outside of, of South African and Namibian borders because I just think he could bring a lot of value to, to, other, to other teams. Um, before I get your reflections on the tournament, maybe we'll just pause for a little bit of an explanation. This African Football League was meant to be 24 teams, uh, was meant to be played uh, throughout the season, but it turned um, into eight teams over a knockout phase. Um, Alistair, do you want to rewind a little bit and, and, and answer how we got here before we get into our reflections on how we felt the tournament the tournament went overall? Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's part of that. It's kind of a hard question to answer, and that's part of the issue is so much of this has been unknown in terms of where the AFL has come from, why it's existed, who's in charge, you know, is it CAF, is it FIFA, is it what are this football, what is it, football ventures, development ventures, who are actually the ones running it. Um, but I think kind of it goes back to when we were when we started talking about it back in 2019, when again Gianni Infantino announced that the the tournament would start, not the African Football League, the African Super League, um, and it would be this brilliant tournament that would generate 200 million dollars a year, and we'd have 20. Uh, he initially actually said 20 teams, not, not and, and then they expanded to 24, and then back to eight. Um, but yeah, I think it's and he, and he was at the final watching yeah, next to he was, and Patrice Motsepe, who no longer owns Sundowns. Of course, exactly. <laughs> um, but I, I think, yeah, I think it's really important to to think about what has the AFL done well and what has it done badly, because I think, and w what do those things answer? Because I think the things that we've seen the last few weeks of what the AFL has done well is 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 the product, the, the football has actually been great. You know, you've seen these these brilliant clashes between the best in the continent. You know that those those that two legged affair in you know Al Ahly and Sundowns. You know, like that was you know, an African kind of knockout tie, but in a completely different way where Sundowns blew al Ahly away in that first game. And then al Ahly blew Sundowns away, but Sundowns were able to hold on for the nil-nil. Um, so you see that the actual product has been brilliant. But yeah, I mean, I was trying to go through all the original promises and ideas that have been broken since the beginning of the tournament. And, and kind of asking myself the same question I asked when the tournament started, which is, what's the point? You know, like, why... Why do we have the African football? Like, there's no doubt that, you know, when particularly when Motsepe came in in, 20, in in 2019, 2020, that, you know, African football is in a dire state, you know, losing, hemorrhaging money, not just losing money. You know, I think even in the last two, two years, they've gone from having over $200 million to just 20 million in kind of reserves. Um, but it feels for me like we've seen this evolution of creating this, this tournament that is ultimately out of CAF's hands that is not been earned by any of these teams. I mean, we, we had Arafat Haji on um, from Yanga and, you know, he was, he was not impressed that Yanga weren't getting, getting into this tournament and Simba were despite Yanga, you know, do back to back double winners and getting to the final of, of the CAF Confederations cup. So that, you know, there's been loads and loads of issues. So it's hard to reflect on this success. And, and but I, I then, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be too critical because I think a lot of tournaments when they first start, there's a lot of skepticism and there's a lot, of, you know, even the world cup, you know, when it started, most of the countries that were invited declined the invitation. And when the champions league started change from the European cup, there was a lot of pushback against it. And now it's the most successful club tournament in the world. Um, but I think it's, yeah, we can get more into the weeds, but it is, I think it's been in many ways, a, a decent tournament this year. Uh, it's had a lot of problems, you know, we were we were told that there were, we we landed on the number eight in terms of teams that would be involved, and we almost didn't even have that. You know, we had to have a last minute meeting with it, with the PSL clubs because they initially the PSL had, had voted that Sundowns wouldn't be able to to participate. Imagine that, you know, they'd gone through the tournament and Petro Petro as well. You know, they're facing a potential two year ban from domestic football, which could have impacted this as well. 
Uh, and then we had, you know, games postponed because we had issues with, you know, getting flights and visas and immigration from from uh, into into Esperance and, and Widad uh, for, for Mazembe and Nyimba. So it's been, you know, I think there's been some really good things about it. I think there's but I think it honestly, I think it raises more questions than it answers in terms of the actual competition. Sure. Let me let me bring my hair in there. But before I do that, just fact check myself and the fact that Mutepe still on sundowns, but he's no longer involved. His son runs everything. So let me let me do a course, <laughs> not a course correction. Let me do a fact check on myself. Yeah, our, our very well paid <laughs> lawyers might be might be telling us <laughs> to strike that off and edit that that out <laughs> without the correction. Um, so um, I'm sure everything is very independent, and I'm sure everything is run in the right ways, um, and there's good corporate governance. I don't want to suggest otherwise. Um, just my hair's got a face that makes me laugh. Um, I was going to go, um, <laughs> it's, it's beautiful. Um, but my hair, let me bring you in here. Gianni Infantino was somebody that Alistair mentioned and I did. He was at the final, um, you know, seeing a Super League in Africa has been something he's spoken about very clearly. When you look at the prize money of it being, I think, 4 million US dollars that Sundowns have won and you know, is it a case of the rich getting richer? Because I'm not sure how that trickles down to um, perhaps uh, parts of the sport that might need it more. Um, but is he, are you surprised at how invested Infantino is in seeing the Super League concept succeed in Africa? And, you know, what could be behind that? I'd be surprised if this were a CAF competition. But this is not a CAF competition. This is a private entity that really is a FIFA competition. Uh, Jenny Infantino is the one that proposed the terms of this competition. He's the one that's been pushing it. He's the one that's really been behind it all. And for me, that's kind of a scary proposition because I don't know what the end goal is. Um, and I, I, I'm, I don't want to be like, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but I see what he does with the, what he's doing with the Club World Cup, how he wants a huge expanded uh, tournament of 32 teams in the summer. And I start thinking, yeah, he wasn't necessarily really against the European Super League. I mean, he was because it, it would have been a, like out of the umbrella of UEFA and FIFA. But I start thinking, what if FIFA wants to create their own league? You know, what if they want to create their own Super League? And is Africa sort of a plaything? Is it a, a test dummy? Is it an experiment? Is this what's happening here? to see if they can if they can pull it off. And if they can pull it off, maybe we're going to have some kind of global league. I think that's what FIFA probably wants to do in the end. Um, some other version of the Club World Cup is something that probably takes place during the year and, and is uh, a lot more successful. And so I, I, that's why I'm not surprised that he's as involved as he is. Uh, it's been interesting seeing all the rest of FIFA's heads, you know, like the Colinas, Wengers, as well, uh, <laughs> pop up in Tanzania and South Africa. But I'm not at all surprised, but to, just to touch on uh, what Alistair was responding to as well. Um, I think the football has been good. The branding has been better than the CAF Champions League. But for me, the most impressive and, and the most beneficial part of the African Football League this year has been the access. Uh, anybody can go on the FIFA Plus platform and, and watch the match. You know, it's been on uh, television rights have been pretty much broadcast everywhere. Uh, if you have access to a television set, or if you have access to internet, you can watch these matches. And I think that's severely lacking in the CAF Champions League, especially in the preliminary stages, but even later on uh, as well. So I think that's probably one of the things that if we're really looking at reforming the CAF Champions League and, and continuing with it as a serious competition, perhaps we can try to pull from that experience and integrate it into the Champions League. I think I, to I totally agree. And I think even like today, I was able to go back and watch watch the game you know the full game on youtube you know yeah. because it, it, we, it caused that free access and even for me i didn't even realize but it's on tnt and D discovery plus in the uk and that's the first time in my memory that a club competition in africa has ever been broadcast on a uk broadcaster uh, which i think is brilliant um i think for me then it raises a couple very frustrating questions um or like frustrations of mine is a you know, I think it's great and I think it's brilliant. I think the drawbacks is it's, you know, it's done out of necessity because, you know, they couldn't get the contracts that they wanted to with, you know, with pe pe people like uh, Super Sports and um, Multi-Choice and stuff. And they eventually got it with BN, right? I think, but it was all kind of that all looked very hairy at one moment, you know, CAF's entire relationship with BN. But I guess my frustration with it all was that was brilliant. Access is fantastic. And I think that's the way to build it, particularly as we kind of going into a future where actually 
you know, on demand or streaming might be more valuable than, than traditional broadcasting, though I think in, in the African continent, that's not going to be changing too soon. But for me, it was the frustration was then the kind of production value was so low. Um, and that's what I found really frustrating of, of the kind of easy access, because if you know, yeah. and I think one of the things that I saw that was, you know, this was and uh, what I was quite excited about was this was a huge opportunity for you know, I would like to have said calf, but the, the runners of the tournament to show the way forward in the similar way that other competitions haven't been able to do that. Actually, you can own your own brand and market that in of itself. You don't have, you know, and that's been a big question in the UK. Will the Premier League start to take over its own production and, and not hand it over to Sky or, you know, be in or whoever and sure. do their own thing. But there was, there was none of that. And, you know, say for instance, we had mm. Cocom's Asmo Jian. I think Asmo Jian is great in a lot of ways. He's a very compelling character. He's got brilliant stories to tell. He's a legend of the game. He's not a great Cocom's like, you know, he's, he, and it's things like that where there was no, you know, and if you know agree. that you're, yeah. And it's one thing where it's like the CAF champions league, where it's frustrating that the production value is low, but you get it because it's the world feed. So it's okay. Because you also, if you're actually in North Africa, if you're in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have BN and well, Super, Super Sport isn't very good at it, but providing that. But when you know you're creating your own brand, the fact that there's no halftime analysis, no pre-game analysis, no, you know, the, yeah, the, the, co the comms and co-comms aren't of a super high standard. Um, I think that's for me is, is the frustration. But I, I don't want to knock the fact that actually having the access to it was brilliant. Um, and I, yeah, can't, yeah, I was very, very grateful for that. Yeah, look, I think this naturally leads to the last question, which is, you know, um, officials like Infantino and Mozepe have said, you know, African football needs to level up. This is the way it can level up. If we have a continental showpiece where we can get the standards better, get people more engaged from a fan perspective, have a product that you can sell and, of course, um, make the competition better for the players and the coaches. Um, I guess... Um, you know, I mentioned the prize money of $4 million that went to Sundowns and, you know, the other teams certainly were handsomely paid for their participation in the, in the tournament. But is there, uh, it, from both your perspectives, a, a better way that we could be seeing that upliftment in the continent? And I know that's a very big question, um, but, you know, maybe just give us your raw thoughts because I'm not expecting you guys to have the silver bullet for this. No, I think... We all, as Alistair said, we acknowledge that the CAF Champions League was broken in a way. Uh, teams were losing money by participating in the CAF Champions League. You know, the with the long flights and the travel on the continent, we all know how that is. Um, you know, and then some of the pitches that they were playing in. And I think we all realize that we're going to have to do something to reform it. What's frustrating about this experiment, the African Football League, is that we all knew that. But... This solution was imposed from top down by somebody that clearly doesn't know the realities of African football. And you could just see that by the numbers he was throwing around, you know. I would have loved for them to do something like some kind of symposium, bring in journalists, bring in administrators, bring in fans, bring in all the different kinds of stakeholders, hold some kind of big, you know, working table discussion and see how can we improve uh, the African Champions League. Because I, I think it... it, it it does have value to continue with the Champions League because the Champions League has been on, going on since 1963. You know, it used to be called the Kwame Nkrumah Cup. You know, there's Pan-African uh, sentiment to it all. I, I really like, it's it's sentimental to us all, you know? So I would have liked to continue with that, but then ask people that are on the ground, how can we improve it? And I think what they would have found is that we, I think most people like the idea of perhaps having uh, either the group stages or maybe from the quarterfinals on, in a singular location as a tournament, kind of like, you know, the European Champions League did with uh, the COVID bubble in Lisbon. You could have like a, a two week or a three week sort of festival. We could all head over like we do for the AFCON uh, in one city. Uh, and, and it would just help so much more with the marketing, I think, um, of, 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 of the product. Um, so overall, like I, there were definitely some positive lessons to learn from the African Football League. It's just a little confusing now because we don't know what the what its future is. We don't know what the future of the African Champions League is. Um, and it's all a little bit in limbo. But um, I think there's nothing that we can really do about it now. But we're just going to continue to sort of stay tuned and see what's in store. Yeah, and, and I think, like, for me, the, the bottom line is, right, is 
this is a competition that is not run by CAF. You know, whether we say who's got the real strength behind it, you know, it's explicitly run by an independent European company. You know, that, that I, as far as I'm aware, it doesn't have any experience in running major international yeah. sporting competitions. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly backed and mainly run in essence by FIFA, right? You look at the sponsors, visit Saudi, visit Rwanda. You know, it's great that CAF can get access to this money, but these are FIFA sponsors. These aren't CAF sponsors, you know? But, and for me, that the AFL, no matter how successful it is, it will devalue the Champions League. And right from the beginning, Motsepe has promised us time and time again that the Champions League is fine. It won't be impacted. And then right before at the kickoff in Tanzania, he then said, oh, well, we have to, we'll have to revamp our club competitions, won't we? You know, and, and, and it's kind of the inevitable that we knew would happen is the Champions League is going to be impacted. And either eventually it's going to be done away with and it's going to be replaced with the AFL or it's going to just be, you know, be left to, to rot and fester into a competition that doesn't, doesn't have any value because, you know, even I, we said it at the top, we joked, but, you know, are Sundowns the champions of Africa? You know, are luckily, we, we don't know, you know, Sundowns, Sundowns just won Africa's <laughs> flagship premier competition and they're not going to the Club World Cup. You know, I likely are. So there, there's a lot of these questions where I think for me, it's the bottom line is you're impacting our biggest and best club competition in a way that will only negatively impact it. And you're replacing it with something that is not an African competition. You know, it has African clubs in it, but it's not, it's not an African competition. Um, and, and I think for me, that's frustrating. And then again, because of that, you know, you know not to speak into my hair's, you know, conspiracy theories, though, I, I hope he, he makes it a kind of regular feature of his new podcast. Um, you know, this, like we're saying, what, what Infantino wants is a strong club world cup, you know, wh whether he cares about Africa, we, we don't know, but we know that his allegiance is to FIFA and building a strong club world cup. And all he needs from that is four strong African clubs. You know, he doesn't need a strong, healthy African ecosystem. He, he needs four good African teams in the same way how, from his perspective, you know, what Saudi is doing is brilliant. You know, it might completely ruin the competitive nature of Asian football for the, for the rest of eternity. But, but will they have four clubs that can now compete with Euro European clubs at a Club World Cup? Yes, they can. Yes, they do now, you know, and that's what he wants from African football. And so that's what we're saying is Sundowns are making just as much money as Al Ahly did from winning the Champions League, although they were promised to make was 11.6 million, not the 4 million. Um, but what African football needs, what African club football needs is not Sundowns getting more money. It's not Al Ahly getting more money. It's not Widad getting more money. You know, these are teams that make, bring in huge amounts of money, whether it's from commercial stuff like Al Ahly or it's from having, you know, one of the richest men on the continent owning you in Sundowns case. What African football, club football needs is, you know, stronger infrastructure, you know, better management. I was speaking to someone today who's talking about how, you know, th the idea that, you know, actually African football doesn't need money. What it needs is, you know, competent FAs. What it needs is competent uh, kind of club competition. And the beauty of that is you see when there is competent, like running of clubs or federations in Africa, more than almost any other continent that is rewarded. I mean, look at Yanga, look at Simba, you know, look at Tanzania. This is a, a league where you've had strong investment from, a media broadcaster over the course of, you know, a commitment of 10 years, you've had two clubs that are competitive, both forward thinking and boom, within the space of a few years, you know, I, I remember when Tanzania was below Kenya in the pecking order. Now the idea that Gormaya could compete with, with Simba or Yanga is laughable. So I think that's the frustrating thing is, is the AFL is there's lots of issues in African football, African club football, the AFL doesn't address any of them and it exacerbates quite a few of them. And I think that's for me, the ultimate thing. And I hope I'm proven wrong. I hope that it becomes this, you know, brilliant club competition that enlifts football. But as we've seen football all over the world, you know, the whole trickle down stuff doesn't really work in the long run and doesn't create sustainable footballing landscapes, but yeah, not to be all miserable. I hope, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that it's all brilliant and wonderful, but we'll see. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you'll put a damper <laughs> on the Sundowns fans. They're, they're, they've got a title. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy it. <laughs> very happy. Um, obviously, guys, certainly value your opinions, your insight. Um, it would be remiss of me, Maher, not to end the pod without finding a little bit more about your podcast, African Fiverside. Um, you know, it's always cool to hear about new content out there and new, uh, new, new, new platforms. Um, but yeah, what, what will your podcast be about? 
Thanks for the platform uh, already. I'm a big fan of On The Whistle podcast, but this is not exactly the same thing as an On The Whistle podcast. Uh, we're more looking towards the history of the African game. So when I say African five-a-side podcast, instead of seasons, our podcast is broken into five-a-side teams. And so the first five-a-side team that we're sort of naming are African heads of state and their policies towards football and sport. So as a goalkeeper, we have the Egyptian former yeah. president, Gamal Abdel Nasser. As a defender, we have Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. And uh, this Friday, we're going to be uh, naming our third uh, member of our five-a-side team, uh, he's from Central Africa. That's all I'm going to say. So it's it's a weekly podcast every Friday. You can find it on YouTube. You can find it where wherever you uh, stream, you, you know, uh, your podcast uh, from audio platforms as well. And uh, yeah, it would just be great if uh, people could show support. And uh, that's it. It's just uh, it's very much a communicate uh, interactive, communicative thing where we're trying to connect with people and just share as much as we can about the history of African football. That sounds amazing and very creative, very unique, um, very highbrow like you, Maher. Um, so, um, so you know, uh, very deep thinking, philo <laughs> philosophical. Um, so, I, I think it's going to be a great. Served me, it's most useless thing I've ever done. But so, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, listen, I'm looking forward to. I know I'm going to queue that up um, on my on my playlist. And for those of you listening out there, please uh, do leave a comment, leave a review. Get in touch with us. We love to hear from you. Whether you like the show, didn't like the show, think my hair's, hair is cool, uh, want to tell me about funny Medina, as some of you do, um, just leave us a comment, leave us a review. We, we love it. And of course, you can find us easily, OTW underscore podcast on X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, uh, and Instagram, formerly known as Instagram. Um, and if you search Facebook and YouTube, you can just search for the On The Whistle podcast. Very easy to find us. Maher, we look forward to your podcast. Thank you again for coming on. Ali, always a pleasure seeing you, my friend. Um, and for those of you out there, um, just have a great week. And we look forward to bringing you the latest in African football and Africa's biggest pride. Salud.